Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And today I'm recording this on, of all days, September the 11th, 2024. It's already been 23 years since that happened, eh? Yeah? Um, you know, and today I suppose because it's that date, it does make me think that that date in particular, 23 years ago, was a pivotal moment in history because that's when we really did start to see the sort of speeding up of us losing our freedoms and our rights in the Western world. And um, in recent years, of course, it's gone critical, hasn't it? And, um, you know, so this is some, one of the things that I do wish to speak about today. Um, of course, uh, the theme of what I'm gonna be talking about today is words, words as spells, yes. Words, I suppose, as magic, whether it be dark or whether it be light. Um, something I want to get to and talk about. But uh, first I want to do is go back and tell you about in the middle of the 1990s I took my tent somewhere, I think South Wales, and I read George Orwell's 1984. As it was only, what, less than a decade at that point, um, it was barely six years after the end of the Cold War, um, it was an interesting time for me to actually properly read that book and for the first time properly understand the concepts in that book. And um, it was pretty freaky to read it, how it seemed to alter my brain chemistry and how it really did give me an understanding of doublethink. Um, new speak, the idea of um, you know, a deleting words to remove the ability to be a heretic in your language, you know, that sort of thing. And then, of course, I also remember a few years later, you know, a few years later when I um, got to about, I think it was 1999, and I remember for the first time in a very long time, I heard an album I hadn't heard for yeah, years, a decade, possibly longer, and that was uh, Duran Duran Rio. Now, um, as I was listening to that album, waves of nostalgia came back and it just brought me back to a time before. And of course, sometimes that's good, but this was quite bittersweet because the first thing that came to mind was, oh, this was during the era of the Cold War. And this was in this narrow window of time where we didn't have the threats with the bogeymen that we ended up with after 9-11 or the bogeymen that we had before 1989, you see. We were in this window of time where, you know, there was this sort of, oh, the whole world's gone nice now. History has ended and we've won and all that. And it was a false narrative, but I remember in 1999, as I was partying and meeting people who were often a decade younger than me, I mean, I was still quite young at the time, but people were a decade younger than me, and I was thinking to myself, these 18-year-olds, these 19-year-olds, they uh, have no, they could forget the Cold War. They could actually forget what happened. We could, um, you know, go into a form of complacency as we forget our history and how I remembered that time. And I remember that the 80s was a time when, yeah, you could say anything, do anything, but provided no one pressed that red button, because we always had the threat of that big red threatening button over our heads all the time. And that had gone. And I was a bit concerned that we were gonna be going into an age of complacency. And then of course, well, 23 years ago to the day, that happened. A Couple of planes went through a couple of buildings and it changed us. It brought us back into the abyss of history that a lot of our leaders at the moment are pretending doesn't exist. They pretend we're in a post-historical world, but no, we're not. Not after that. We got dragged back into history as a result of, you know, that uh, was a spontaneous demolition that went on on that day. And we've been watching our freedoms being eroded away. And then as time's gone by and we've ended up in this world where a digital panopticon has been, been built around us. And we're now finding that, uh, that the regime, you know, the regime, the globalist regime, with all its, uh, what do I say, franchised out mini governments, which, I mean, they're all part of the same bloody thing, aren't they, these days, you know? And all the different parties, which are all part of the same uni party these days, right? Well, they've become scared of words. They've been, become scared of people using words. Um, and uh, they want the monopoly on words. And they've brought a lot of buzzwords that of course the, uh, the, the chattering classes with their luxury beliefs all want to use around the dinner tables in Islington and places like that so they can all show how right on they are in front of their middle class idiot friends. And some of these words, I've made a list, random list, and this is only scratching the surface, but you know, pronouns, he, she, the, they, they, them, zemza, 
gender fluid, trans, queer, LGBTQ+, intersectionality, diversity, equity, inclusion. Words are violence. Misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. Climate emergency, global boiling, far right, Islamophobia, transphobia, racism, re-education, unconscious bias, etc, etc. I mean, these are just random, different uh, woke words, if you like. And uh, as we've gone into this sort of totalitarian dystopia, we have to adopt their language. Well, we don't, right? But my thing is, do not allow these people to have you incorporate that into your vocabulary. Don't, um, you know, let that happen. Don't use these words at all. Now the trouble is, of course, is they've then created things like hate speech, hate crimes, non-crime hate incidences, non-crime crimes. It's gone very Orwellian double thinking, hasn't it, at this point, right? And so what do we do is we find ourselves in a time now where we have basically malevolent sorcerers, um, you know, running the world. And um, our only, um, the only defense that we have are words that we can use. And they are restricted in our use of language on the internet and threatening us with incarceration for using the wrong words in the wrong context, according to them anyway. And of course, Keir Starmer in the UK wants to ban smoking outside pubs, which will actually mean that people won't go to the pubs and there'll be less people where working class, less places where working class people can meet and a lot of whom would be scared to go online, which means less people talking to each other, less conversations that people are going to be having with each other. He wants us to not talk to each other. And that's the thing, because they're scared of words. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And so we shouldn't be scared of words. You know, we should know the words that uh, we are being encouraged to use that we shouldn't use, and we should know not to use those words, because then we're not under their spell, you see. But the thing about English, English started in the whole Proto-Indo-European language system from Sanskrit. Sanskrit was the language of the gods, as they said, and it was kind of like a very high elven language if you were going to use a Tolkienism to describe it. It evolved into many different languages which split off into different factions. And you could say that if you were going to compare this to Lord of the Rings at some point, um, a very guttural black speech of Maud or equivalent or two or three of these may have formed along the way until we got to the last language in the Sanskrit journey, which at this present time is English. Yeah. Now, I would say the thing about English is that because it's a, a language with many ways of describing things, because it's absorbed different versions of other languages, versions of words, um, you could say that English is the language of the sesquipedalian, the person who likes to have a very, very, very large vocabulary. There are so many words and so many synonymous descriptions of things that you can use in English that, uh, you know, now people um, go online and like to do negative associations, like to say that English is a bad language because you work for a week and weak is opposite to strong. And then you have time for the weekend and weekend sounds like weekend. Except they don't tell you the positive name like holiday. Yeah, it's a holiday. What is a holiday? Holidays are holy. In America, they call it a vacation, which may be a negative use of language because vacation, there's nothing in a vacant, there's nothing in a vacant lot. And there's nothing on the entire vacant, right? But in English, it's a day that's holy. So we have still got some positive uses of these words. And um, so, I mean, I can't think of any words that I would use to describe, you know, what goes on. I know that whenever I'm being, um, whenever I'm looking at governments, uh, one of the words that comes to mind is cacistocracy. And when it comes to um, elite members who are not really all that good, I call them cacistocrats, because it basically translates, it comes from Greek, it basically translates as uh, an elite class of people who are not as good as they should be at the jobs that they're doing. Right? So it kind of makes them, you know, use a word like that, kind of takes a little bit of their power away from them as well. Another word that I like as well is kleptocrats, because then you think, oh, they're stealing from us. There you go. Uh, so I like referring to them as that. These are quite sort of multi-syllabic intellectual words. They don't really sound like slurs or insults. So this is one of the things that I do like to do. I'm not much into my, um, I'm not into word salad. You know, if anyone uh, starts getting all word salady with me, I ask them if they want to have any French dressing with it. I'm sarcastic like that. But I am into word smithery. 
And that's the most important thing of all. So we are in a time like this where the, the weapons in our arsenal are words. We have to listen to them, you know, we have to listen to these machine people talking to us with all this bollocks about uh, diversity and all that rubbish. Diversity built Britain 50p from 2020, let me get on this side, heads and tails. Diversity built Britain, well, only if you include the Irish, no one else, right? So, so a little bit of an exaggeration there, um, but that's a kind of a good use of a magic spell to create historical revisionism, if you get what I mean, right? This is um, what's happening now. And so the best thing I suppose that we can do at the moment is we need to know how to use like poetic prose. We um, need to remember that, um, you know, a lot of the, like the great bard himself, Shakespeare, just to quote a very short line from him, the whole world to stage. Well, that makes it, you see, everyone's actors on this stage. They've all got roles to play. And it reframes everything, the way you think of the world right now, just by thinking like that. And then I was wondering to myself, well, in the UK and in America at the moment, now I'm not really a God botherer, I'm not really into religion, but it did occur to me that uh, the Bible um, was under attack and Christianity was under attack. And I thought, well, why would that be? And it occurred to me actually that you can get a lot of quotes. Now, of course, you can, you can get a lot of dark stuff from the Bible. You can get a lot of light stuff from the Bible and you can interpret it in so many different ways. But, uh, you know, if everyone had that thought, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, now that's a good example, then no one would be able to um, judge anyone else for being bad on, uh, because they therefore have to look at themselves first and realise, well, I'd be a hypocrite if I did that. And um, it's like a, a simple sentence could, you could say to a bunch of people who are standing in judgment of other people, all sanctimonious, like they're better than them. But then you have to ask them, well, have you never done anything wrong in your life? And it's like simple phrases and sentences like that, which are not hateful, but ultimately disarming. And one of the things that we have to realise about the world that we live in at the moment is that if we're careful in the words that we use, so they cannot pin anything on us like hate or incitement or anything like that. The, you know, English is a good battleground of language that we can use. And it's appearing that the Western world is most under attack, especially the Anglosphere. That if you're sensible with your use of words, if you're wise with your use of words, you know, then it's very difficult for them to get you on anything. You just have to um, be educated, self-educated, I suppose, is the best way to go about it. Um, you have to be bardic in your approach to language. It's very important to be like that. And, um, you know, all right, you could say, oh, why should they stop me saying this? I'm going to say this anyway. Then you could go tweet something that would get you put in prison. Well, I know it's unfair. I know that it's unfair that we've ended up in this situation. It's bad. But, you know, do you want to go do that to yourself? You could think, oh, right, well, do I just admit defeat then? You could think like that, or you could think, well, you just have to be smarter and wiser in your use of words. You have to raise your game. You have to know how to communicate in a way that doesn't come across as hateful, but doesn't come across as insightful, but is ultimately disarming to an adversary. You've got to be cleverer than you were before. And this is a challenge that we find ourselves in right now, because we have a bunch of control freaks running the world like a malevolent force. They want to actually destroy human nature. That's what they want to do. They don't realise that they themselves are at the behest of human nature themselves. And by being a cold, Machiavellian, sociopathic control freaks, involves the dark side of human nature to be like that. And they want to eradicate human nature without thinking that they would have to need to eradicate it from themselves as well. And, you know, that just isn't possible. They are trying to contain the uncontainable. They're trying to tame the untainable. And that is the problem that they have, is that it just cannot be done. And in recent years, it appears that the powers that be, or as I like to think of them as the powers that soon to be were, are panicking, scared, looking like deer in headlights at the moment, as they don't know what to do. 
and they keep doubling down, they keep tripling and quadrupling down. And why do they do it? Because they don't want to look like fools in front of the people they're keeping up appearances with. I would suggest that you go on in YouTube and you look up um, the, uh, the, the uh, what's it, the film, uh, a clip from the film Hans Christian Andersen starring Danny Kaye made in 1952. And you get the um, clip where he's singing to the kids about the, uh, the emperor's new clothes. And you listen to the full story in its full context rather than, you know, rather than just as a phrase that people use. Because it goes into the story, the full story behind it. You realise that it just comes down to people not wanting to look like fools in front of their contemporaries or the people that they're trying to impress. Right to the point where they're quite willing to live the most preposterous lies in order to not look like fools in front of people who are colluding together to keep up false appearances in a bullshit reality. And it only needs one person to come along and say, hang on a minute, this ain't real, and the spell is broken. And that's the time that we really find ourselves in at the moment. So there you go, you know. Yeah, and um, we just have to remember that. As a result of that, the people who are in control are on a very unsustainable path. Um, it's just like a dying thrashing beast, isn't it? You just have to not poke it, not poke the beast, no. Um, you just need to dodge its thrashing movements. That's all you have to do. And then wait for it to kill itself. Because that's ultimately what it's up to at the moment, killing itself, right? So, yeah, that's what it comes down to. Anyway, you know what? I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I think the way the world is at the moment, I just want to leave it now and I want to go into space. So, watch this. Okay, well, I am currently leaving the Earth at the moment, and uh, this is good, because, I mean, who wants to be on the same planet as Keir Starmer anyway? Certainly not me, and Elon Musk understood that, and let me borrow his ship. So here I am leaving the Earth, on embarking on a good journey. This ship has not only got an improvement on Star Trek Enterprise D um, warp drive, it goes a lot faster, but it's also got Zen from Blake 7 as the onboard computer. So, without any further ado, Zen on screen. Zen, give us a diagnostic of this ship. All systems are functioning normally. Right, well that's okay, let's go somewhere then. Please state course and speed. Okay, Zen. Plot a course for the moon Arcovia B round the planet Arcovia A in the Veldelic system of the Triangulum Galaxy. Speed maximum megawarp. Confirmed. Brilliant. So now we're on the way, and uh, oh, I better be careful because I can feel the warp drives about to kick in any second now. And uh, oh, oh God. I think those inertial dampers need to be tightened up a little bit. Mind you, great view, the stars going by, you can see them there. And um, while you're watching there, I'm actually looking forward and I can see them from the, uh, from the cockpit side, so uh, you know. If you'd like to see what it looks like at the front, I just uh, have to flick over to the front view of the ship. Now you might notice that there is a port loo in the way. Now why is there a port loo in the way? Well, it's nothing to do with the cheap toilet facilities on this ship, no. That's my ship, that's the TURDIS, you know? All of time and space from Gallifrey, bigger on the inside and all of that, yeah? Looks better than the Doctor's TARDIS though, doesn't it, hey? Anyway, yeah, I bet Elon that my TURDIS could get me back um, to a faster than this ship could get me to Arcovia B. And I was a little bit confident earlier, but now I am noticing the sparseness of the stars in front of me. Let me just turn around and see. Oh my God, we've left the galaxy already. We've, we've left the Milky Way. That didn't take long, did it? Wow. Oh, wow. Does it look like from outside? Pretty good. You know, I wonder if my guide will work. Let's check this out. I'm not in a galaxy. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has detected we are traveling through interstellar space. Please choose a galaxy from the menu selection. You have chosen Triangulum Galaxy. Happy travels. And don't forget your towel. Wow, that's great. I suppose it's as easy as just changing countries with the Tom Tom sat and have that, is it? Hitch's got Hitchhiker's Guide to Another Galaxy. There you go. Right, well, in front of me, I can actually see a small splodge which is getting bigger at the moment, and uh, I think we're approaching Triangulum already. So, one thing I have to do is get the TURDIS out of the way. Now, this is something I can do. Let me just do this. 
Uh, you didn't expect that, did you? No. There's an app that it collapses into. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, you can see we are hurtling through the sky towards Triangulum right now. It won't be long before we're entering the galaxy. Now, the one thing I'm looking forward to the most on this planet is chocolate bananas. They have banana trees, which have brown bananas with a chocolate flavour. I mean, what could be better than that? You know, I mean, that's, that alone is worth going there for, you know? Right, it appears that we are sort of leaving the interstellar part of space and entering Triangulum at the moment. So, till next time, when I get back to uh, Earth in a TARDIS, See you later, Space Alligator. See you soon, Space Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.